In this video, I would like to explain briefly and in a nutshell what Ricardian equivalence is and what it means for economic policy. Well, excellent uh, treatments of um, Ricardian equivalence include the books by Abel Bernanke and Crashor, Macroeconomics, the ninth edition, and Buda and Wiplosch, 2017, Macroeconomics, a European text. And the articles that I use in the presentation and that I mention um, are the ones by Barrow, 1974, A Government Bonds Net Wealth in the Journal of Political Economy, the original article by David Ricardo, an essay on the funding system, and a rather recent paper by Shapiro and Slemrod, uh, whether the 2008 tax rebates stimulated economic spending and which came out in the American Economic Review. In addition, I'm highly indebted to Franz Hof from the Vienna University of Technology for his discussions of Ricardian equivalence, from which I learned uh, a great amount. So thank you very much, Franz. The point of departure here is that in introductory courses on macroeconomics, we've learned that consumption is a function of autonomous consumption. So that's what everybody consumes, even if they do not have any income. So you have to uh, have food and shelter and so on. So that's autonomous consumption, plus a part that is income uh, dependent, which is C1, the marginal propensity to consume out of additional income. And uh, income is gross income, net of taxes uh, T. So if income, net income increases by a certain amount, then consumption increases by this increase in income times the marginal propensity to consume. Therefore, if in this uh, setting the government lowers taxes T, this leads to an increase in consumption. And since the traditional Keynesian view has it that the, that the economy is not in a full employment situation, we would have that this additional demand leads to additional uh, output that is uh, produced, additional workers who are employed and so on, and this in turn raises income, which then again raises consumption. And the process goes on and converges basically and gives therefore rise to the tax cut multiplier, which um, shows to which extent overall consumption and overall income increases when the government decreases taxes. And that's uh, typically larger than uh, one, so uh, because it's a multiplier effect. So the bottom line in the traditional Keynesian view is that a tax reduction stimulates private consumption and GDP. Now, based on the original article by David Ricardo, Robert Barrow, in his influential article in 1974, argues that this misses a huge part of the story because households are forward looking. And forward-looking households, by definition, also consider future income in their uh, decisions, in their consumption decisions, and not only current income. And in addition, the households uh, understand the governmental budget constraints. So if the government um, decreases taxes today, then it has to repay its um, debt that it incurs at some point in the future. To illustrate this argument, we need at least two time periods, today and the future, and an intertemporal price, which is the interest rate with which I can shift resources over time. Now, households have an intertemporal budget constraint. They can consume today and in the future, and if they consume in the future, we have to discount their consumption to uh, today. And that means that the left-hand side of the intertemporal household budget constraint is the net present value of consumption. And this must not exceed the net present value of disposable income, which is the right-hand side of the intertemporal budget constraint of households, which consists of income today, which is um, income minus uh, taxes, so disposable income today, plus disposable income in the future, again discounted by one plus the interest rate. The Government has a similar intertemporal budget constraint. It can spend on governmental consumption, G1 and G2, in today and in the future. Future governmental consumption is again discounted by 1 plus the interest rate. And this has to be financed by governmental taxation, either again today or in the future, where future governmental taxation is again discounted by 1 plus the interest rate. So the intertemporal governmental budget constraint state, states that the net present value of governmental consumption expenditures are equal uh, 
to the net present value of uh, tax revenues. And the interesting thing and the important thing here is that the slope of the two budget constraints of the households and of the government is the same. It's minus one plus the interest rate. Now we can illustrate this argument uh, graphically by using the definitions of the budget constraints that we had on the previous uh, slide. So here we plot consumption today and consumption in the future in one graph where we have consumption today on the horizontal axis and consumption in the future on the vertical axis. Next, we draw the intertemporal budget constraint, which, as we already said, has a slope of minus one plus r. So, for example, if we use the whole available resources to buy consumption only in the first period, we would end up in this point here. So then we could not consume anything in the second period and would consume everything in the first. Or we can choose to consume everything in the second, then nothing in the first. So then we would end up at this point here. And any combination that lies along the intertemporal budget constraint with the slope of minus one plus r, because we can shift um, consumption intertemporally according to its, the intertemporal price, the interest rate R. Then households have a certain income, we assume that's just uh, exogenously given, uh, Y1 minus T1 in the first period and Y2 minus T2 in the second period. So here it is drawn in a way that second period income is lower than first period income. For example, you can think of um, uh, a decrease in income over the life cycle. To some extent. So then we would end up in the income point that is uh, mentioned here. However, of course, households can move along their intertemporal budget constraint and choose the point of consumption that leads to the highest utility level. So what we typically do then is to um, go to the point where we can reach the highest indifference curve. So that would lead to the highest utility level. And in this case, it's drawn like that, that this point would lie here. To reach this point from the income point, the household would decrease first period consumption below first period income. So then the household would basically save for in being able to increase second period consumption above second period income. So basically here, the household would move from the income point to the optimal consumption point by saving in the first period and spending more in the second period. Now, what happens if the government reduces first period taxes? So that would be T1 is decreased. So actually, if this were the only thing that happened, we would move the income point of the household to the right. So basically that would shift the intertemporal budget constraint to the right. However, we know, and also the households know, that the government has to fulfill its intertemporal budget constraint. So if it reduces taxes today, then it has to increase taxes tomorrow by the amount it in decreased taxes today, multiplied by one plus the interest rate, because um, it has to pay also interest on its debt that it incurs. But then, actually, we would end up at a point along the original intertemporal budget constraint of the household. And this, in turn, implies that the household can still choose the old optimum it had previously. So that's still a feasible consumption point. And since indifference curves didn't change, the preferences of the household didn't change, that's exactly what rational um, households uh, and forward-looking households would do. So what they would do is they would save all the, uh, the tax uh, reduction that they get, would put it on the bank account, earn the interest rate on that, and would in the future repay exactly one plus the interest rate times the amount of taxes that they saved in the first period. And this would allow them to consume exactly again at this original optimal consumption point. So what does this mean basically in terms of intuition? The government hands out a tax rebate to the households, but the households know that the government will have to pay back this tax rebate in the future, including interest. 
So the households still want to have the optimal consumption point in the temporary and not depart from it. So the optimal thing to do is that they save the total tax rebate, let it earn interest income to be able to repay the government in the next period, including the interest earnings. And that means that actually the governmental uh, stimulus is fully compensated by the households. So the households would not change their consumption behavior. Consumption would not increase when governments decrease taxes. So that the decrease in government saving is perfectly offset by an increase in private saving, actually. And the conclusion uh, is this main insight of the Ricardian equivalence that the timing of taxation does not affect private consumption whatsoever. And that in turn implies that the tax cut multiplier is zero. So we cannot have a boost in consumption and therefore not a boost in income. So in the end, consumption and income would not rise. The tax multiplier effect would be zero. Now, is this the full story? No, basically not, because of course, this reasoning had also received quite a lot of criticism. Most obviously, the interest rate of households and the government differ in reality. And if they differ, then of course, the slope of the intertemporal budget constraint of the household and of uh, the government is different. And then, of course, a changing taxation schedule over time would also have effects on um, the uh, household budget constraint, intertemporal household budget constraint, and could have income effects to households such that they change their consumption behavior. Then, of course, all types of departures from perfect rationality of households, for example, hyperbolic discounting or bounded rationality and things like that, could lead to a situation where households do not behave in a way that they uh, save the total amount of um, the tax decrease uh, today in order to repay it in the future. So all these departures would also lead to a departure from um, Ricardian equivalence. Then credit constraints, of course. Households could be credit constrained such that they do not um, reach the unconstrained optimum in the first place. That's most obviously if you are uh, young, then you typically cannot ask the bank for millions of euros to be able to uh, finance your optimal consumption uh, spending schedule over the life cycle. And if this is the case, the original point would not have been the optimal point in the first place. And a change in the, intertemp uh, in, in the intertemporal uh, schedule of taxation might lead to a different effect. So then th this might uh, change the um, credit constraint of households and therefore lead to consumption effects. Then distortionary taxation would also um, change the picture quite a bit. For example, if taxation is on income and not lump sum taxation, then it might be the case that it uh, reduces incentives uh, to work. So if you reduce taxes, then you might increase the incentives um, to work uh, today, and that might lead to additional income. And also that could lead to departures from Ricardian equivalence. And of course, incomplete intergenerational altruism. So here the assumption was that the person uh, who repays the debt in the future is the same person as uh, the one who got the tax rebate in the first place. But this need not be the case, of course, at the aggregate level where we have uh, an overlapping of generations, basically, and old people die and are replaced by new ones. Now, if everybody is perfectly rational towards the uh, offspring, nothing should change, because then a perfectly altruistic person, who is also uh, perfectly rational, would save the tax uh, reduction today and bequeath these savings to the children, who would then in the future repay the governmental debt plus uh, interest. However, there could be incomplete intergenerational altruism, which is actually also uh, typically the case in uh, most models, so that uh, this uh, aspect uh, would only play out imperfectly. So there would only be imperfect compensation uh, intertemporally by bequests. So therefore, there are many reasons for why there could be departures from Ricardian uh, equivalence, and therefore the question, um, comes up who is right in the end. 
And here Shapiro and Slamrod in the 2009 paper analyzed what actually happened with the tax rebates in 2008 after the um, uh, yeah after the uh, beginning of the uh, Great Recession basically. And what they find is that households actually increase consumption by about 20% of the tax cut that they received. So Ricardian equivalence does not hold completely, but uh, basically, there is a strong argument in favor of um, the case that households uh, spend uh, save a significant amount of the tax rebate that they get.